And the Queensland Mycological Society acknowledges the traditional custodians of country throughout Australia and recognises the continuing connection to lands, waters, fungi and communities. We pay our respect to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander cultures under Elders past, present and emerging. As I'm speaking to you from the Sunshine Coast, I would like to acknowledge the Gubby Gubby people in particular, who are traditional custodians of this land. Welcome everyone. Thanks so much uh, for that, Wayne. And um, I would also like to acknowledge uh, just myself, the traditional owners on the lands in which I'm situated and which I uh, work and live and, and which we're all meeting as well uh, this evening. Um, so as uh, Wayne said, I'm Adam. Um, so I was indeed a 2021 uh, uh, Young Tall Poppy uh, Science Award winner um, uh, last year um, and I'm just about to start or I've just started my um, ARC DECRA uh, research that's a three-year uh, research fellowship and that's actually focusing a lot on what I'm talking about today which is as you'll see from the title um, a muscular mycorrhizal fungi and herbivores and as I've said quite explicitly in the title, it's a complicated relationship. Um, so, and obviously by the very nature of mycorrhizas, those of you who are familiar with mycorrhizas, um, it will involve plants, of course, and by the very nature of herbivory, it involves plants. So really this is all about those tripartite interactions between the fungi, um, the plants and the herbivores that feed on those plants. So what I'll do is I'll just give you a bit of background um, to sort of set the context um, and that should uh, then sort of facilitate me being able to um, give a, a summary of three projects that I've led relatively recently. Um, yeah, so I'll start off by focusing on one aspect of these interactions and that is uh, the interactions between uh, plants and insects. And in fact, it's often described as this never ending war or this war that's been going on for um, say about 300 uh, million years or so between plants and herbivorous insects. Um, and so you might think, well, that's a very long time for war to be going on um, without someone eventually declaring victory. Um, and you might assume that between plants and insect herbivores, you might assume that the victors, of course, would be the insects because plants are sessile. Um, they can't run away per se. Um, so they're pretty vulnerable, right? Um, but actually plants have evolved a vast array of defenses um, that they can employ um, to deal with attack from insect herbivores. And these defenses are a product of millions of years of uh, evolution and uh, largely a product of this co-evolutionary arms race between plants and insect herbivores, where plants have evolved defenses to deal with herbivory. And then in response, the herbivores might then evolve counter adaptations or strategies to deal with that. And so we have this arms race in that way. And so this has really been one of the main drivers of a lot of the diversity of plants and insects that we see today. So, um, very cool interactions, of course, so it's not surprising that they've fascinated researchers and scientists for generations. Um, and they say about half of the, uh, of the insects that exist, uh, of the described insects rather, um, feed on living plant material in one way or another. And it was, of course, the seminal paper by Ehrlich and Raven back in the 60s um, that really uh, shone the spotlight on this idea, this understanding of the coevolutionary arms race, um, where uh, it leads to diverse radiation in these groups. Um, and of course, because we have such diversity of insect herbivores and their strategies of feeding um, and counter adaptations to plant defenses, many insects have become uh, pests of agriculture. Um, and so that's something that uh, is important to think about, obviously, as well. So I'm just going to focus initially on plant defences, um, and then we'll lead on to uh, the fungi, which I'm sure is what everyone's really interested in. Um, so plant defences, as I mentioned, plants have evolved a vast array of defences, different strategies uh, to handle herbivory. And there's many mechanisms, and we still don't, of course, really understand all of them, by far, no way or near it, but uh, we can try to, um, I guess, get a handle on them a bit better by classifying them into categories. And so we can 
broadly put them into two types, them being uh, either resistance associated or tolerance associated defenses. So by tolerance associated, uh, this is often associated synonymously with compensatory growth in plants. So the plant's able to um, withstand tissue loss, it's able to regrow, uh, reproduce and still be successful uh, despite the uh, tissue loss from the herbivore. So they're able to tolerate uh, the attack. Uh, plant resistance is more to do with those mechanisms or those plant traits that reduce performance of insect herbivores. So insect uh, growth might be reduced, their reproduction or um, survival consumption. Um, and it also refers to preference of the, uh, of the herbivore for the plant. So uh, does, do those defenses perhaps just make the insects avoid eating that plant altogether? So those are just uh, sort of a brief intro introduction to some of the plant defenses. So of course, I've mentioned a very long-term relationship that's been going on between plants and uh, insects, uh, quite, uh, I guess, uh, not very pleasant one, I suppose. Uh, but there's been an equally long relationship going on uh, that's far more amicable, and that's between plants and a group of fungi known as our buscular mycorrhizal fungi. And so this is a relationship that's been going on for probably a bit longer, in fact, but 400, 450 odd million years. Um, and yeah, this is the relationship between plants and our buscular mycorrhizal fungi. Now, of course, as the name mycorrhizal suggests, myco, fungus, rhizal root, um, and they associate with plants by colonizing their roots. Um, and the vast majority of plants form mycorrhizas and probably most, we would say definitely that most plants would form, uh, the vast majority of terrestrial plants anyway, would form our buscular mycorrhizal, our buscular mycorrhizas. And it's pretty ubiquitous. So it's often said that the majority of plants, strictly speaking, don't actually have roots, they have mycorrhizas. So that's certainly one way of looking at it. Um, now these fungi don't have delicious mushrooms, unfortunately. Um, although having said that, I'm actually not sure if anyone's actually um, tested what they actually taste like. Uh, I suppose in theory you could really uh, consume some concentrated um, mycelia or something, but uh, I don't know, that's an unknown I suppose. Um, but anyway, so they colonize the roots of plants, but they also colonize uh, the, the soil as well. So we have the, the fungi create these large networks of hyphae or mycelia uh, in the soil connecting. And then in this way, they connect the plants uh, to each other. They connect to the, to the soil uh, environment as well. Um, and in this way, they form a really important um, structures in the soil and they, they play important roles in lots of soil ecosystem processes as well. But I still haven't really explained what the interaction is. So it's a complicated interaction and probably by the end of this talk you'll be sick of me saying it's complicated or context dependent or variable. I suppose that's a lot of what we have in ecology. Um, but to describe it uh, fundamentally I suppose or basically it's based on the transfer of resources primarily nutrients and carbon. So here sorry in this little figure here so we've got what's to be a close-up of the of the root and we have our um, AM fungus here colonizing the roots or so going into the cell into the roots uh, and entering the cells in some cases as well forming these structures called arbuscules uh, and these are one of the key sites of exchange where the fungi provide the plant with access to nutrients primarily we often think of phosphorus but also nitrogen and other things and water while the plant provide the fungi with carbon in the form mostly of hexose sugars but also as lipids. So we have this uh, relationship and they form this symbiosis, uh, which is often beneficial for the plant and I suppose always beneficial for the fungi because they're obligate symbionts. Um, but we are interested in this tripartite interaction, so between the fungi, the plants and the herbivores. So then how do AM fungi affect insect herbivores? Or rather, how does the AM symbiosis affect uh, insect herbivores? Well, there's a significant body of literature. There's a long history of research that's actually gone into AM fungal plant herbivore interactions um, and looking at different aspects of it and at different, I suppose, levels of those interactions. Um, and the answer is to that question is it varies and it depends, but there's certainly some trends we can pull apart, so some, some broad patterns. So we know that the AM symbiosis can uh, benefit the herbivore 
so I suppose negatively impacting the plants will be, they can have positive effect on uh, the herbivore, it can have a negative effect or it can have no effects on the performance of the insect or on the herbivory. But the outcomes depend on a couple of things. So it depends on whether the insect is a chewing insect or whether it's a piercing insect. So whether it's our little uh, lepidopteran chewer here or our aphid here, which is sucking. And we tend to see that chewing insects tend to be negatively impacted while piercing or sucking insects often might not be affected or um, benefit from the AM symbiosis. So if their plant is associating with AM fungi. It also depends whether the insects are generalists or specialists. So in this case, generalists tend to be more negative affected, specialists not so negative affected. So it matters uh, the identity of the host plant, uh, but it also matters the identity of the fungi as well. And I'll be talking a lot about that later on. Um, so we've got all these contexts. So these are the outcomes. What are the potential mechanisms? Well, the first mechanism and maybe the most obvious one is the fact that it's a symbiosis based in nutrition exchange uh, with carbon. So obviously for a lot of plants associating with AM fungi increases their nutritional quality. So this might be a mechanism by which it would benefit the herbivores potentially. But we also know that AM fungi can uh, or do strongly affect uh, and um, uh, boost, I suppose, uh, jasmonic acid, so key uh, plant phy phytohormonal path defense pathways. Um, uh, and so in this way, it's understood at the moment that the, the prime plant defenses such that when if there's uh, if the plants are colonized by AM fungi and then they're attacked by a herbivore, then the immune response, if you want to put it that way, or the, the defense responses are greater than if the, the plants were not uh, associating with AM fungi. And the jasmonic acid pathway and other defense uh, responses then lead to the production of resistance associated uh, secondary metabolites. So if you remember resistance, where they really negatively affect the herbivore in one way or another. Um, but of course, because the AM symbiosis allows greater resource acquisition uh, in many cases for the plant, then this could support compensatory growth. It could support uh, plant tolerance to herbivory. So they're just able to grow more, they've got more access to resources, and so they can just deal with it better than if they didn't have access to those, um, I suppose, hard to reach resources in the soil. But firstly, I just wanna talk about below ground insect herbivores because yeah, I feel like I've been saying this for a long time, but they're neglected, uh, although I'm not sure I can say that anymore because in the past 10 years or so, there has been a lot of research that's focused on below ground ecology and below ground, uh, sorry, root, root feeding insects and AM fungi. But still, I think we can still say that compared to the collective data and research that we have on AM fungal effects on above ground herbivores, we certainly have much less on below ground herbivores uh, comparatively. Um, but we might expect them to actually have stronger effects on each other, root feeding insects and, and AM fungi, because they share that same physical environment, the soil, and they also share, share the same uh, plant parts as mycorrhizal fungi, the roots. So they're directly interacting with each other. So um, uh, you could say that the, there could be more pressure on these two groups of organisms to affect each other, and because they have this extra dimension that above ground herbivores don't necessarily have. So we were particularly interested in this uh, study. I'm just going to uh, uh, summarize for you as best I can. Um, ask the question of how does the AM symbiosis affect plant responses to root herbivory? So we wanted to know in particular plant responses to root herbivory, the effect of AM fungi on that. Um, and in particular, in this case, we were interested in plant tolerance or compensatory growth. Um, because as I mentioned before, it makes sense that the plant might have uh, will have more resources at, at its disposable with disposal with AM fungi, and so they're better equipped to tolerate attack from below. So essentially, we for this experiment we uh, used uh, the plant system we were working with was sugarcane, so a Saccharum uh, species hybrid was our system of choice, and essentially we chose this because it's a highly mycorrhizal plant, it's a C4 crop. Um, and of course, it's now been cultivated across uh, Northern Australia in particular, north of Queensland. Um, oh, and I suppose actually down into Northern New South Wales as well. Um, and they also have a voracious root feeding insect known as the cane grub, which a lot of you might know um, because it was the 
cause of the uh, introduction of the cane toad, I suppose, um, and we know that worked out well. Um, so I suppose that's what's made them famous uh, for many. Um, but essentially what we did here was, uh, I'm uh, getting distracted, uh, I suppose what, what we did here was we basically grew the plants to sugarcane without any AM fungi or we grew them with AM fungi. So for this we inoculated the plants with a, actually what was a commercially available inoculum of four AM fungal species. Um, these species were all uh, glomerules. There were um, two, uh, one rhizophagus irregularis, um, a chloroideoglomus and two phenyliformis species. And, uh, and then half of the plants were subjected to a root herbivore, which was the cane grub. Um, and these were subjected uh, towards the end of the growth period. And so we basically sampled the plants and we measured a few things above ground and below ground, essentially to see how the plants responded to the herbivore with and without um, the uh, AM fungi. So what did we see? I'm now going to tell you to prepare yourself because I'm going to throw a lot of plots at you. So bear with me. I'll explain. I know it's it can sometimes be a bit much um, when you're looking at other people's data. Um, so here we're looking at photosynthesis. So these are the rates of photosynthesis in sugarcane, which is generally a very highly productive plant. It's a very efficient photosynthesizer. Um, and in this plot, we've got uh, through time. So just uh, spot measurements that we took throughout the growth period of the plants. So the dark red line here with these points is the plants without AM fungi. And then the blue line is those with AM fungi. Um, so what you can see here, there's clear divergence around week 13, where the AM fungi caused an increase in photosynthesis. Now, this response is often reported. Um, the symbiosis creates a carbon sink, because if you remember, the plants provide carbon for their fungi. Um, uh, and also because plants have these, plant, these fungal partners, they also have better access to nutrients, so they're better. They tend to be have higher productivity more generally as well. Here we're looking at below ground biomass. So this is our root system, our root mass. And so here we've got our box plot. And essentially we've got our plants without any AM fungi and we have our plants with AM fungi. And then our dark boxes are the ones without the herbivore. Sorry, our dark boxes are the ones with the herbivore. Our blue are the ones without. So without, with, without, with. Surprisingly, the root herbivore reduced root mass. Maybe that wasn't so shocking. That was something we expected. Um, and generally, the main effect of AM fungi was that we saw an increase in root mass as well. So root herbivory was reducing root mass. AM fungi was promoting it. But what was particularly interesting here was what we were seeing above ground. So we've got two more plots here and similar layout as before. So we have our no AM fungi and our AM fungi uh, without and with the root herbivore. Uh, here we're looking at above ground biomass and above ground carbon uh, in the leaves. And we saw some interesting patterns here because you might have already noticed that uh, we saw that the root herbivore caused an increase in above ground biomass where those plants with their AM fungal symbionts had uh, the greatest above ground biomass. And we saw a similar pattern with above ground carbon where uh, root herbivory, so attack from below, is causing an increase in carbon above ground. And the plants with the AM fungi had the greatest concentrations of carbon. And generally, we saw this pattern with other variables that we measured above ground as well. So phosphorus, obviously a really important uh, aspect of the AM symbiosis, um, where uh, we saw an increase in above ground phosphorus, but really we only saw this in plants with AM fungi uh, when they were attacked by the root herbivore. And here we're looking at leaf phenolics. So phenolic compounds are multifunctional in plants. Uh, they have a variety of different roles, um, but they're well known to have a resistance uh, associated, the act as resistance uh, mechanisms against herbivory. And we'll touch on that in a minute as well, a bit more. So we actually saw the plants were allocating more phenolic compounds above ground in response to root herbivory only in the plants with AM fungi, we actually didn't see this, uh, this increase in phenolics in the plants without AM fungi. So what might be going on here? So we saw all these things going above ground in response to this below ground attack. Um, and this actually, these kind of responses aren't, uh, they are documented uh, or they're, they're known that plants to deal with herbivory sometimes uh, will allocate resources away from the site of attack. Um, uh, it's thought that this was would a protect those resources, but also enable future growth, uh, so that the plants are able to grow, I guess, more effectively and more efficiently once the threat of herbivore attack has passed.
And interestingly, we also saw an increase in our buscules in the roots in response to herbivory. So um, in this image here, this is just a stained root and their buscules are these just these fuzzy things here. They almost never look like the perfect tree-like structures you see in the diagrams. But here we have some arbuscular structures in the roots, so that this is the fungi. Um, we've got some vesicles and spores in there as well. And essentially we saw when the plants were attacked by the root herbivore, we saw more arbuscules in the roots. And these are the sites, uh, the key site of nutrient exchange. So there's a lot to unpack about what can be read into the amount of colonization by the fungi. Sometimes it's not really too indicative of function necessarily. Um, but potentially here, we saw that there was a strengthening or more demand from the AM symbiosis as the plants required more resources to allocate above ground um, because they were dealing with the stress of root herbivory. Um, so it's potentially seeing a strengthening of the symbiosis there. So to summarize, what did we see here then? So the larvae, the root feeding insects were reducing uh, root mass, not a shock. The attack on the roots, this root loss resulted in greater above ground biomass, greater carbon above ground, uh, phosphorus, as well as phenolic compounds. Uh, and as I mentioned, this is likely to be a tolerance associated response, allocation of resources above ground. Um, protecting those resources, but also facilitating regrowth. If you're al allocating a majority of your resources above ground, your, your uh, photosynthetic capacity uh, arguably might be greater such that when the threat of attack is passed, you're better equipped and I guess better situated to just regrow and tolerate that response. And this was enhanced by AM fungi. Um, so those plants with the AM symbiosis had the greatest um, resources above ground compared to those that did not. So arguably they would have been more successful in the long run. So abuscular mycorrhizal fungi can help plants uh, with their tolerance associated responses. That's pretty cool in and of itself, I think. Um, but if you remember, I said at the beginning that these interactions are highly context dependent. So what we saw here with this particular system, with these particular fungi, um, and in this context, um, we might see this in another situation, but we equally might not as well. And that wouldn't at all be surprising. Um, and one of the key components of that is the importance of fungal species identity, because AM fungi are not just um, they don't all function the same, they have diversity and they have diversity in their functions as well. Um, so what do I mean by that? Well, we know they have AM fungi have lots of different functions and they vary in their ability to do certain things in ecosystems and for plants. Um, and that's the same situation uh, in terms of plant herbivore interactions as well. So for example, we might have what I've called fungus A, um, and so this uh, fungal species might have a particular uh, functional trait where it's really effective at upregulating uh, resistance associated defenses. So maybe it upregulates jasmonic acid and particular defense rates, def defense traits, sorry. So this enhances resistance, great. But we might also have AM fungal uh, taxon B, um, and this actually has no real effect on defense be it resistance or tolerance, but maybe it has other functions that in, under a different situation would provide certain functions for the plant. But in this case, we don't see any effect. And then we may also have fungal species that actually reduce defense traits. So again, perhaps they're particular effective in other situations, particular effective partners for particular plants, and but we don't see it in this situation. And in fact, because of the complex trade-offs, um, perhaps within the plant or between the fungi and the plant, then we're actually seeing the defense outcome is actually reduced by associating with AM fungi. This is something actually we did find uh, in a different project that I won't explain today, uh, where we found important root defense metabolites were actually suppressed in, in, some, in some plant species. I won't get into that. That's another talk. Um, but there's also going to be community and diversity specific effects as well, because we know that in nature, plants associate with multiple AM fungal species at the same time, and it changes over time as well. Not only this, but um, there's, it's really important for us to think of this as there's a growing interest in agriculture for using AM fungi. So we wanted to look at this a bit and see how inoculation with uh, different commercially available inoculants at the time might have different uh, defense outcomes for plant defense uh, against insect herbivory. 
So this is just a small study that we conducted to have a look at this. Um, so essentially, we did another sort of pot experiment and an inoculation experiment. And this time, instead of using sugarcane, it is another crop we used here. Uh, it was wheat, so triticum, uh, triticum aestivum. Um, and for those of you that are familiar with AM fungi and the AM symbiosis, uh, at least within an agricultural setting, um, wheat is probably one of those crops that's known to have, uh, I suppose, not a massive growth response to the AM, uh, AM associations. Um, but we still see there's still responses, but I suppose it's known to be less responsive. Anyway, that's just a bit of background. But essentially, we uh, grew the plants with either no AM fungi. We grew them with just a single AM fungal species or taxon. Uh, we grew it with four AM fungal taxa or with a native community. And this was just a community that we extracted from field soil. So it's a resident AM fungal community from an arable field. The single taxa, single taxon was Rhizophagus irregularis, and our four taxa was the, actually the same inoculum that we used previously. So we had Chlorodioglomus to Phenyliformis, and of course our old friend Rhizophagus irregularis, which is often the star of the show. It's one of those model AM fungal species. And then we have our native community. Now we didn't identify the community in this case, but um, we did see that we did uh, know that there was uh, diversity in that community uh, because of the morphologies of the spores. Um, but we don't really want to say too much on that because we didn't actually uh, identify them in this case. Um, but essentially, we were interested in um, assessing how the plants responded, sorry, how the plant defense uh, mechanisms were affected um, by these different uh, fungal treatments. Um, and so basically we subjected half of the plants this time to an above ground herbivore. So it was a uh, Helicoverpa punctigera, also known as the native budworm, or there's other names as well. So it's a Lepidopteran caterpillar native to Australia. Um, and in this case, we were particularly interested in um, the phenolics. So I mentioned them before. Um, they have uh, multiple roles, but uh, includes things like our phenolic glycosides, our flavonoids, tannins, um, and these are all uh, have defense functions in the plant. And they can act as feeding deterrents, uh, affect insect fitness, etc. So essentially, we were interested to see how phenolic based resistance was affected. So how were the phenolic concentrations in the plants affected by these different fungi? And did that then have a knock on effect to the performance of the insect? So what did we see here? Well, in terms of the phenolics, so another box plot, um, we've got our noem fungi, our single Rhizophagus irregularis, our four taxa. So we're getting a kind of an increase in species richness here, I suppose. And then we've got our native uh, AM fungal community. Um, and essentially what you can see is we found distinct differences in the levels of these compounds in the leaves. Herbivory actually didn't have a, a, a significant effect on the levels of phenolic, so there was no sort of detectable induced response, at least in this instance, of phenolic uh, defences. Um, but what we did see was that basically plants with the four AM fungal taxa or with the, four, with, the, with the native AM fungal community, they had greater levels of phenolics in their leaves compared to plants with either no AM fungi or just associating with Rhizophagus irregularis. So we saw these differences in phenolic uh, defences. What did this mean for the insects that were feeding on these plants? Um, so you can see it's kind of almost a, a mirror image here. So these responses kind of mirrored our phenolic responses. So the insects that were feeding on the native AM fungal community actually performed the least. So this is a relative growth rate on the y-axis here. So they had uh, they were growing the least, to put it simply, whereas our insects that were feeding on plants with only rhizophagus actually performed the best or better. I guess these aren't actually different, but essentially they were performing better here while the feeding on these two uh, plant, plants under these treatments, uh, they tended not to perform so well. So we saw a reduction in, in their performance, which is uh, how we would measure resistance. And if we just look at the performance of the insects, so again, here we're just looking at a relative growth rate, but this time against just phenolics, uh, just looking at the concentrations across all treatments. Uh, and we can see a negative correlation um, to support this, where higher phenolics did explain, at least to an extent, the decline in insect growth rates. So in this case, what was going on? Well, maybe a rhizophagus irregularis on its own might not have been particularly effective at boosting phenolic defenses in wheat in this instance. 
um, perhaps the greater diversity that was we found in our four uh, our four tax on inoculum, or the greater diversity we might have found in our native community. Maybe there's uh, more opportunity for other sort of partnerships to be established with the plant, and so greater diversity just means more chance you'll find. Sorry, sorry, my my uh, microphone went off here. So more chance that you'll find um, a partner that will boost defences in this instance. Um, but it could also be, so it could be driven by particular taxa, but we could also see uh, combinations of taxa. So maybe there, maybe um, Rhizophagus irregularis did play an important role in, in the four AM fungal treatment, but uh, it, we only really see those effects when it's in a, in a community, uh, in a community sort of combining with other, uh, other fungi in the, in the roots. So it's also sort of, suggests, of course, this is a pot experiment, so we can't say too much. But this also suggests that uh, maybe applying inoculants, uh, especially to field soils in an agricultural setting where you maybe already have a high abundance and maybe diversity of AM fungi, uh, applying inoculants might not, not necessarily give you defense benefits, um, at least any defense benefits that are greater than the fungi that are already present in your field soil. So maybe uh, approaching it slightly differently um, uh, to manage the AM fungi that you already have uh, present in your ecosystems and in your agro ecosystems. So that then leads me on to talk a bit more about diversity and community composition of AM fungi and what that means for uh, plant insect interactions. So we know that maybe higher diversity or higher species richness uh, might make for more favorable partnerships to occur uh, between uh, plants and fungi. And by that, I just mean it benefits the plant. Well, you'll find that we often do talk about it from the plant's perspective, but of course that's very sort of um, anthropocentric. Um, ecology doesn't quite work all, uh, all just to benefit us, but I suppose that's how it works uh, at the moment. Um, so, because what might be best for the plant might not be best for the fungi, at least in the short term. That's a different discussion. But it, essentially, the identity of the fungi matter uh, because we know they're functionally different. Um, but this also matters in a community context. So my examples here, are very simple communities with just two species, but just to give you the idea. So we might have, for example, fungus A, which is functionally able to boost plant defense, and fungus D, which also boosts plant defense. And together, as they colonize the roots, through that, they can synergistically have this additive effect where they really have this huge effect in boosting plant defense. Great. So there's, so there's a super combination, a super community of AM fungi that can support plants uh, in their uh, resistance or tolerance to herbivory. But we also have, might have the case where we have uh, a plant, uh, a fungus, sorry, that's boosting plant defense. And then we have this fungus B again, the one that didn't really, its function wasn't really to do with plant defense necessarily. But actually in, in nature or as it's, it's, it's colonizing the roots or in the soil, maybe this is a more, I suppose, competitive AM fungal species. And so it actually outcompetes perhaps um, the fungus A. And so actually this ends up actually being the more sort of uh, driver of the outcomes in terms of plant defense. And we do see this, the studies that uh, clearly show this. Um, people, uh, Alison Bennett in the US and other groups have shown that you, this exact outcome where uh, you might have a defense enhancing fungus, um, uh, but then applied together with another fungus has actually no effect. Or also where we have a reduction in defense as well, because perhaps maybe fungus C here, which isn't really good at enhancing defenses, maybe it's more dominant uh, for whatever reason. Uh, it would depend on the context of the of the system, of the soil substrate, of the host plant, etc. So it can be quite complicated in this sense. So fungal identity, fungal community composition can really matter when it comes to these uh, sort of uh, tripartite interactions between fungi, plants, and insects. But a big issue with all of this and our knowledge around all this is that um, most of the work on AM fungal plant herbivore interactions is heavily biased towards just a few fungal taxa. These are commonly used sort of ruderal fungi um, that we know about. Um, so it's probably why they're used because they're, they tend to be the easiest to, I suppose, uh, grow in pots and to, they're, they're maybe resistant to disturbance. Um, and so they tend to have these sort of ruderal traits uh, where they can, they can deal with those kind of disturbed, disturbed ecosystems. And so this is just showing tax on usage rate. Um, this is just a survey of, a, a, of studies, say, I think it was in the last five years from, well, from 2018, the five years pr previous. And you can see there's, 
great bias towards particular species and then some research looks on others. You might think, okay, well, we're still getting a good portion, but we know that there's about 300 described species of AM fungi and putatively we would say there's about 1,700 or more probably now um, putative species of AM fungi in nature. So you can see we've really only used a very, very small handful and studied a very small handful. Um, so we need a, need a lot more research in this area to expand our knowledge of how AM fungi can affect plant herbivore interactions. So we have a really narrow understanding um, of how the AM symbiosis affects these interactions. Um, and as part of this, we need more data on natural communities of AM fungi. So I mentioned before that in nature, um, most plants will associate with multiple AM fungi and that will change through time as well. So different seasons, you might see those a turnover of those communities uh, and those communities in the soil and the communities in the roots as well. So it's all very well and good. And of course, I completely appreciate, I do it myself, of course, where we, we tease apart particular species or just a small group of species to see how they affect plant function and defense. Um, but in nature, that often isn't how it works. Um, so we have to really start scaling up a bit more. Not to say that there isn't a need for more of the sort of uh, experimental uh, work at the sort of lower level, at the more uh, controlled level. We definitely need more of that. There's so much more to find out. But no, there isn't enough push, push towards understanding ecosystem or uh, community level responses. So this was what our next study uh, and our final study, maybe you're pleased to hear. It's the last thing I'll talk about. Um, this is what we were looking at here. So this is another sort of small study, a sort of pilot study, actually, in a way. Uh, we were wanting to, to look and compare three naturally occurring communities of AM fungi. So rather than using commercial inoculants or pure cultures, we want to just look at natural assemblages. And so we wanted to see if we took complex communities of the resident fungi in the soil, would we see distinct plant responses to herbivory if we use them in an experiment? And also to see if we could then see any potential patterns in the fungal communities in the roots that might then explain any of those distinct responses to herbivory. So we started by taking soil from communities that we expected to be different from each other. So we were looking at soil, uh, AM fungi taken from uh, an organically managed uh, crop field, um, soil from a remnant uh, sclerophyll forest, and soil from another organically managed crop field that was in fallow. So there was no active, I guess, cropping happening uh, for the, the 12 months prior. So it just had some weeds in it, I suppose. Uh, and we also had no AM fungi. So essentially, we inoculated plants with the AM fungi sourced from these uh, habitats. Now I'm calling them soil A, B, and C because it's not really correct to call them by their, name them by the habitat they were found because it's maybe misleading because these were just single sites. These communities aren't necessarily representative of these habitats. We just wanted distinct um, natural assemblages um, and use them in our, in our study. So we had soil A, B, and C sourced from these, these habitats. And we grew sorghum, uh, which is another C4 grass crop, um, highly mycorrhizal, uh, and is also fed on by the cane grub. So we used our, our old friend, the cane grub again. Um, so half of the plants that were grown under each of these AM fungal treatments uh, were subjected to root herbivory. And so we were interested to see how plants responded to this. We wanted to see if plant growth and nutrient responses to the root herbivore differed uh, depending on the AM fungal community. And then to see if, well, what communities are actually in there and might that explain something from what we know. Um, so of course, after harvesting the plants, first off, we needed to identify the root colonizing fungi. We wanted to see the fungal community composition in the roots uh, and also look at their diversity. So for this, we used amplicon sequencing or uh, DNA metabarcoding, also called. Um, and because we were specifically interested in AM fungi, we targeted the single subunit R RNA gene region. Um, I know a lot of, uh, obviously, for broader fungal studies in metabarcoding, people often use the ITS gene region. But for AM fungi, uh, SSU uh, gives you a bit better resolution and allows you to identify to uh, ta uh, taxon level or species level. Um, and so that's what we did. So referencing to the Mariam database, um, which is the uh, AM fungal specific DNA reference database that allows us to identify the species or, as they're known in the database, uh, virtual taxa. Uh, 
so we could see the relative abundances and who was in there. So what did we see? Well, first off, we're looking at our relative abundances here of our different AM fungal genera in the roots. Um, so, uh, so we've got our roots uh, identified the fungi in the soil A derived community, soil B and soil C. We didn't sequence the no AM fungal uh, control uh, because we didn't expect any AM fungi to be in there and we just confirmed uh, the absence of AM fungi through root staining. Mostly a cost, uh, cost saving reason, I suppose. Um, so here we're looking at the relative abundances uh, and you'll see some similarities and difference here. So this is the, the relative and we've got our color coding to match the, the abundance of the genera. But most noticeably, uh, what I want you to draw your attention to is the difference in the glomerules. So our chloroidal glomus and our glomus, so our blue and our, our dark red. And so you'll see that in the soil A community, these are highly abundant and in our soil C, now, glomus and chloroidal glomus are present in the soil B roots, but far less so. And in fact, what we see in the soil B roots is a far greater abundance of paraglomus and the sudden appearance of ambispora, which was actually absent from the other two uh, plants, groups of plants. Um, we also carried out a species indicator analysis or a genus indicator analysis, which allows us to identify particular species or genera that are most strongly associated with or indicative of particular communities. Um, and so this confirmed to an extent, uh, I'm just showing the ge uh, indicator genera analysis, um, where ambispora and paraglomus were strongly associated uh, with our soil B roots um, and chloroidal glomus and glomus strongly associated with our soil C roots. And in fact, if we also focus in on these genera in terms of their relative abundance, we can again see so our glomus and our chloroidal glomus. Um, these were significantly more abundant in the uh, A and C, A and C, while ambispora and paraglomus were significantly more abundant in soil B. Okay, so that gives you an idea of some of the community composition that we saw in the roots. So A and C seem to be um, similar in terms of their abundances of our glomus and chloroidal glomus, um, while B seems to, be, seems to be standing out a little bit. So what about some of our diversity metrics here? So firstly, in terms of our alpha diversity, so uh, here we're looking at virtual taxon chow one diversity, which is essentially just species richness, but it takes into account a rare taxa. But in fact, actually our species richness showed the exact same pattern. So there were significant differences in the alpha diversity of our three uh, treatments. And you can see here that soil A community had the highest alpha diversity, B and then C had the lowest uh, species richness. Here we have a, a PCOA, so a principal coordinates analysis, which generally just shows how similar or rather dissimilar our communities are. This is based on a Bray-Curtis dissimilarity index, which takes into account species richness and their relative abundance. So looking at, I suppose, a bit, struck, a bit more of the structure of the communities. Um, and essentially, I guess the closer the points are together, the more similar they are, the further they are, the more dissimilar they are. Um, and you can see um, that in particular, soil B is actually standing out a bit more than the other two. Um, but in fact, all three communities, uh, the structure of these three communities were significantly different all from each other. But soil B community was actually a bit more distinct than the others. So I've taken a lot of time to describe the AM fungi in the roots, both their community composition and their community structure and diversity. But I think that's important because this is something that we're really missing in our understanding. Um, and we really need to try to begin to tie together how natural communities and uh, natural assemblages of AM fungi that we find in nature, how they relate to how plants respond to herbivory. Um, and that's really the question that we were asking here. So how did the plants with these three communities respond to herbivory? So here we're just looking at below ground biomass of the plants. So we have our no AMF, our soil A, B and C. Okay. Our herbivore treatment is indicated by the dark and the, the, the black points and the, uh, I suppose, quite bright purple points are those with the herbivore. Now, there's actually a lot to interpret in these data, but I'll point out just the key things in the interest of time and trying to make it simple, I suppose. Um, so you can see the plants basically grown with no AM fungi or the plants with, with community B in their roots um, had significant reductions in their biomass, uh, in their root mass when attacked by the herbivore. 
So reduction in root mass, reduction in root mass. We don't see this reduction in plants associating with soil A or B derived fungal communities. So potentially, were these plants in A and C, were these plants able to compensate better for root mass losses by increasing their biomass below ground than those that were associating with the soil B derived fungal community? Maybe. However, and also I will note as well, it makes could make sense potentially because as I mentioned, glomus and chloroidal glomus are root rural species that are able to fast colonize uh, disturbed areas and maybe they were able to better support uh, and they're very quick at acquiring resources. So this recent study, they just found that comparing actually paraglomus and ambispora. Anyway, so maybe they were better able to support tolerance for soil A and C communities. However, what you also might be noticing, oh, what you also might be noticing, I'll just go back, is you might be thinking, wait a minute, uh, if it, well, overall, soil A community actually has, with no herbivore, actually has less biomass, and soil C has even less biomass. So if we're looking at a situation where these plants didn't have a herbivore attacking them, then actually a lot of these plants maybe were doing worse with the fungi than they were without it, which might be, I guess, counterintuitive to how you think of AM fungi. Um, but of course, if we look at the plants with the herbivore, so just our purple points, then you do see, oh, well, the no AM fungal plants were doing relatively the worst or worse comparison and also soil C, but A and B were doing well when the herbivore pressure was applied. Um, so this highlights an important message um, that the particular functions or perceived benefits of AM fungi for plants um, might not necessarily be apparent in certain contexts. Uh, and they may, may only become apparent when particular stress is applied, for example. So in this case, herbivory. Um, and there's a bit of a, a more discussion around that and that we've kind of oversimplified our understanding of AM fungi, uh, which as a result has actually led to sort of a uh, neglecting part of their ecology as well. So we also analyzed a whole suite of nutrients, but they followed a very similar pattern to what we saw with the root mass. We have root herbivory, um, looking here at phosphorus, nitrogen, and zinc. So root herbivory reduced uh, the total content uh, of these nutrients in the roots. Um, but only with the plants without any AM fungi and the plants uh, with the soil B sourced fungal community. Whereas those plants with soil A community and soil C didn't have losses in response to herbivory. Um, so we have these distinct responses to root herbivory. Uh, and remember fungal B community composition was somewhat distinct in terms of the identities of the fungi and the relative abundances compared to A and C. So to summarize, our soil B community was distinct in that we had far more far more sorry paraglomus and ambispora, and our uh, glomerules uh, were less. While our soil A and C community were more than seventy five percent dominated by uh, glomus and chloroidal glomus, um, and this translated to the soil A community had an increase in tolerance, as did the soil C to root herbivory, while the soil B community and the noem fungally treated plants were arguably potentially more susceptible uh, to root herbivory. Um, now, of course, this was only focusing on below ground um, and um, we didn't measure anything above ground, um, but uh, this, you know, it just gives us a bit of an idea about what's going on in these systems. And we also need to look at this in, in other uh, plant systems and with other AM fungi. But this was just a bit of a pilot study. So to finish, yes, it's a very complicated relationship. But we know that AM fungi can help plants deal with herbivory. We know that AM fungi uh, can enhance chemical, uh, so we're looking at phenolic defenses against insect herbivores, but this varies between fungal taxa and communities. Um, and we know that below ground responses to root herbivory depends on AM fungal community composition and structure. Um, and an important message is that it is too simplistic for us to think of AM fungal AM fungi as a simplistic always plant mutualists that increase plant growth and nutrient uptake and defense. The outcomes depend on fungal composition and diversity and also the environmental context in which they're found. Um, and so we might not see benefits that we expect um, uh, under certain contexts, essentially. So that's basically it. I just want to thank funders and institutions. But in particular, I want to thank uh, Anna Eng and Dr. Bree Wilson, who worked a lot with me on uh, those projects, the last two projects, um, and also uh, Scott Johnson and Jeff Powell, uh, who uh, I worked with and have worked with for a long time. Um, so yes.
hopefully you've understood and digested some of that and it wasn't too much uh, for you. Wow, no, that was um, that was really good. That's a, an incredible amount of study you've done and there's more ahead for you, I suspect. Yes, well, I hope so. <laughs> there's still too much we don't know. Uh, so, yeah. I have a couple of questions for you. Um, I'm curious about how you measured things like above ground carbon. I imagine that would be an interesting thing to measure. Were you burning plants and weighing the remains? Yes, essentially. <laughs> Although it sounds it sounds less less it sounds less brutal. I suppose. I'm sorry. It sounds harsher than it is. It sounds more brutal than it is. It sounds um, maddening. Yeah, so uh, we just used, uh, I guess, it's known as the LECO, L-E-C-O machine. And so it does do the combustion method to measure an inf infrared spectroscopy, I think, for which it is for the for the, the carbon. Um, and it's the same method we use to measure nitrogen, total nitrogen in the plants as well. Um, but one thing I've actually been really interested in thinking about doing, but I suppose you can't do everything, is uh, there's those groups that also label the carbon and label the, the, the nitrogen and can actually detect exactly how much, say, of the AM fungal acquired nitrogen or uh, actually is then delivered to the plant uh, and then actually then delivered to the insect, which is quite cool. Um, uh, yeah, very cool. Anyway, yeah. Um, I do have a question from the room. Yeah. From Vanessa Ryan. Are these species of fungi you are studying native to Australia? Have you thought to look at the species associated with agricultural plants, such as sugarcane and wheat, that have escaped the fields and are growing wild? Mm, yeah. So AM fungi are a bit funny in the sense that... Um, I suppose if the global diverse, if you look at it at a global scale AM fungi, they don't, there isn't much endemism for AM fungi. So we actually find every, uh, every, we can't really say species because it's, I suppose we haven't found every species, but at least every uh, uh, genus of AM fungi. Every species of AM fungi you find on every continent. Um, and so, uh, there isn't necessarily, I suppose, AM fungi that are particularly native to Australia, per se, that we understand it. Um, but there certainly are AM fungi that we tend to find in agricultural systems. So uh, we tend to find those um, uh, ruderal fungi that I, that I mentioned before. So those that can, I suppose, tolerate disturbance a bit more. Um, uh, and those tend to be uh, glomus species, actually, or chloroidioglomus. Uh, so it kind of made sense, even in our small study, that we found those particular taxa uh, in our arable fields compared to with our sclerophyll forest, where we saw less of them. Um, so yeah, I don't know if that answered the question, actually. But yeah. OK, thank, thank you very much. Um, I think Luke has raised his hand. Um, everyone, you may unmute yourselves if you would prefer to ask your question verbally than, than in chat. Do you want me to stop sharing so it's not Here distracting? Sure, okay. Um, Warwick has asked a question. And yeah. the question is, how do the foliar phenolics help the sugarcane plant against root herbivory? Does mm. it transfer the phenolics from the leaves to the roots? Yeah. Well, the answer, short answer to that is I don't know. Um, it did seem like a funny, uh, a funny strategy for the plant, but it was like, you know, that those were the data. Um, yeah. So in theory, there's a lot, I guess we can only speculate about that. And that's a really good question, actually. Um, obviously, it didn't necessarily help the plants um, directly deal with root herbivory. Um, but there's lots of things you, it might be. It might be that they were increasing phenolics because phenolics, some phenolics also have structural roles in the plant. So it could be related to the plant uh, reinforcing its above ground plant tissue, not necessarily against direct herbivory above ground, but just to ensure um, so, so, so uh, strong um, and uh, foliar uh, tissue above ground so it's able to photosynthesize and then regrow after attack. Um, and I suppose sugarcane is well known as being because it's just so productive as a as a as a plant. It just grows so much and it photosynthesizes so efficiently. Um, I suppose I'm just assuming here, but it's more likely to have tolerance-based strategies than resistance-based strategies. Although we do know it does have some resistance-based strategies, but that's a different talk. Um, so you're right; it wouldn't necessarily directly help the insects. Uh, sorry, help the plants deal with root herbivory. 
there was a theory that maybe the plants then anticipated that the, the larvae would, uh, when they pupate, they obviously become adults and then feed on the above ground plant tissue. So that is maybe they're anticipating that the attack from above following the attack from below. So the insects then, uh, when they become adults, but uh, cane grubs tend not to actually attack, tend not to feed so much actually on above ground uh, plant parts of sugar cane. It's more just the roots. Move on to things like fig trees and things. Good. Um, uh, Luke, did you have a question? Yeah, yeah. Thanks for the uh, presentation, Adam. That was really good. Um, during the first study you presented, you mentioned that plants allocate resources away from, from the regions under attack. Um, in the case of, of that study, their roots. Mm -hmm. um, so I wonder, taking a micro, microcentric viewpoint, uh, do, do you think that the AIM fungi um, follow a, a similar trend by channeling energy away from their vesicles and, and perhaps, perhaps into our, our bustle production? For, yeah. for I guess like a an, an instantaneous source of energy rather than storing it away from later for later. Yes, absolutely. Yes, absolutely. It could be a strategy that they use. Um, so especially with the for that study with the inoculum we used, that was with the four AM fungal species. They most of them are ruderal species, so they do tend to be quick colonizers and they tend to have quick uh, sorry, sh sorry short um, life cycles, I suppose. Um, and so they're well known to be able to deal with, I suppose, a disruption uh, to their host plants. Um, but yeah, it could be that when to deal with that sort of stress that rather than storing um, things in vesicles that they, yeah, they then try and take up as much carbon as they can. Um, yeah, I think that's a, a, a viable, a viable hypothesis. Um, yeah. Adam. Well, that was great stuff. I think you made some really important and interesting points on the way through there. One was that um, mycorrhizal fungi increase the nutritional value of plants, which is um, a fascinating, a fascinating thing. So, you know, <clears throat> let's go organic. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. We absolutely need more data. We, we know so little. And um, I guess there is a slight bias in the, the, the species used for studies. Yeah, and it's probably the same, I suppose, for other groups of fungi. Um, and I suppose the world over, we tend to have our favorite uh, favorite taxa uh, the, because they're particularly, um, I guess, uh, beautiful or interesting or, or you know, uh, whereas AM, AM fungi generally, people might think are quite boring because they don't have, you know, uh, cool mushrooms. But um, yeah. Interesting stuff. Lachlan uh, has asked, <clears throat> when you tested different communities, of AMF, did you identify or look for any influences of other groups, example, pathogens or saprotrophs? Um, uh, no, the answer to that is no, I did not. Um, with the first two studies, so we used because, uh, or with the studies uh, where we used uh, the native AM fungi, actually with all of them, I suppose, we were either using a commercial inoculant, and so we were actually just applying spores. Um, and so the it sounds a bit complicated, but we basically gamma irradiate the soil so there's actually nothing in there. And then we just apply the AM fungal spores. Or if we are looking at native communities or naturally occurring uh, communities, it's probably not representative just to have the spores. So we try and have sort of, I guess, live soil inoculation. Um, but obviously, as you mentioned, different uh, sources might have also have different uh, groups in there, like pathogens or saprotrophs. So we then apply a, a microbial wash to all of the pots. Um, so it's probably an imperfect approach, but um, and so there are some, I guess, biases in that as well. Um, but it's, yeah, I guess it's a standard approach that's taken with AM fungal um, experiment experiments, pot experiments. And so that microbial wash is essentially a mix of of I guess soil slurry from all different soils mixed equally and then that's applied generously to all the pots theory being that you've kind of standardized so there probably will be pathogens and saprotrophs in there but they'll at least all be present in all of the pots so they won't there, there, there wouldn't be any sort of some pots that have particular pathogens or saprotrophs and other pots that don't but what it doesn't answer the question is then particular pathogens or saprotrophs might be interacting with the AM fungal species. So yes, we saw AM fungal community specific effects, but it may also be 
interacting with the other microbes in the soil. So say species A, which isn't present, is present in one of the pots, but isn't present in the other treatment. Maybe it's an interaction that we're seeing as, as well. So yes, you're right. So that's also something that's, that needs to be sort of teased apart. Um, yeah, more research, I suppose. Very good, thank you. And um, David Holden has a question. I would love to know if AMF insects affect insect susceptibility to pathogens, but I guess that is an altogether different topic. But just curious, what cane grub species were you using? That's actually a really interesting question because in uh, another study we did, we actually did look at insect immune responses. So we looked at uh, the um, uh, phenoloxidase response and the, the, the uh, melanization response in insects, which is how insects, a lot of insects will, it's the first line of defense as opposed to insect pathogens. And we actually did find in a study we did that um, the presence of AMF in the soil increased um, insect immune uh, immune responses. So it was almost like as though they were being primed by the ins primed by the presence of AMF. Um, completely speculative, but we kind of speculated that oh maybe there are particular uh, receptors or protein receptors of the AM fungi that are conserved that we might also find in some pathogens that the insects respond to, and so that's why we saw this primed um, uh, um, immune response in the insects. Um, and the cane grub species we were using was uh, the uh, uh, dermal pied albohertum, so it was the greyback uh, cane grub. Teresa, fantastic study, many thanks. Have you ever looked into the association of myxomycetes and their enzymes with AMF? No, but it sounds really interesting. So <laughs> you can tell me more about that. Uh, Another three to five years, I suppose. For yes, exactly. Um, there's, I mean, I don't need to tell everyone here, but there's so much going on in the soil. Um, uh, so there's, there's so many interactions to tease apart. Um, it's great. Great stuff. Thank you very much. That was really great, Adam. Thanks.